Um, so Felix is from Karlsruhe, at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. He started with his PhD in, well, he finished his PhD in 2014 with Subir Saka in Oxford, then went on to DC for a postdoc, uh, and then a junior faculty position in Aachen. And since 2022, he is in Karlsruhe. Uh, Felix is an expert on dark matter physics in general, and in recent years, he has been mostly focusing, I think, on light in physics, weakly coupled physics, uh, and looked at beam dump experiments and other experiments and explored new ways how one can probe for those particles. And today he will be telling us about sub-GV dark matter, so, so light dark matter, about resonant asymmetric or inelastic status of sub-GV dark matter. So please, Felix. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, hi to everyone on Zoom. Uh, thanks for joining. Uh, so this talk is actually a, a premiere for me because it's the first time that I'm presenting from an iPad. I hope this works out. It took me a while today. And the one thing I haven't managed to get to work is a pointer that you can see on Zoom. So apologize, apologies for that. If you're here, you can see uh, the pointer, but I think we will all manage. Okay, so as Michael said, um, I will tell you about sub-GV dark matter and I will be more precise with what I mean by that. Uh, as, as we go along. And specifically, I want to point out various versions of sub-GV dark matter, various directions in, in model building that are interesting uh, related to the keywords here in the title, resonant, asymmetric, and inelastic dark matter. And again, I will explain what I mean by that. Um, I should say, first of all, that um, the work that I'm presenting was, as always, uh, thanks primarily to the PhD students involved uh, for the first paper here, this will be the bulk of the talk. This was in particular my PhD students, Samir Balan and Taylor Gray from Gothenburg. And for the second paper, towards the end of the talk, this was Giovanni Dallavalle Garcia, who's a uh, joint PhD student of myself and Thomas Schwitz. So let me start with a question that we all would like to know the answer to, which is uh, what is the, the mass of dark matter? And uh, at, at first sight, uh, this can be almost anything. We have a very, very weak lower bound of something like 10 to the minus 22, maybe 10 to the minus 21 electron volt uh, from the requirement that somehow the, uh, the, the quantum nature of dark matter is consistent with astrophysical structures. And we have upper bounds on the range of hundreds or even more solar masses uh, for the case that, that dark matter is in the form of astrophysical objects. And the range between that we can broadly uh, divide into three different parts. Uh, below something like an electron volt, um, dark matter is sufficiently light that, that we have large occupation numbers and, and we can think of dark matter as being wave-like, in a sense behaving almost like a classical wave. Whereas above an electron volt up to something like the Planck mass, we are really in the regime of particle physics. We, we think about uh, dark matter in, in, in terms of fundamental particles. Whereas at, at larger masses, uh, we need to think somehow about composite objects or in fact, astrophysical objects like primordial black holes. Um, I will focus entirely on, on the range in, in the middle. And in fact, I will try to narrow this down even more um, using various different requirements um, that we have on uh, potential dark matter candidates. Uh, the, the first one uh, is written up here is the warm dark matter bound, which roughly speaking requires dark matter to be heavier than a KV in order for it to, uh, to have sufficiently, uh, uh, sufficiently small free streaming uh, to form small structures in the early universe. Um, but then there are stronger bounds that I will get to in more detail in a second. Uh, the nucleosynthesis bound above something like an MeV and the Lee-Weinberg bound above something like a GeV. And from the other side, uh, we call the unitarity bound, which applies to um, uh, thermal dark matter candidates. And if you take the strongest of all of these bounds, you end up with a quite narrow mass range between something like a GeV and, and 100 T, uh, roughly speaking. And this is kind of the traditional window uh, that we've been interested in a lot in the context of dark matter physics. This is where WIMPs live. And this is where, where we've been looking for dark matter for, for many, many years, uh, with the result that we have incredibly strong exclusion limits on 
the interactions of dark matter particles in exactly this mass range. So in particular, from dark matter direct detection, we can, we can place these uh, very, very impressive bounds on the interactions between uh, dark matter and, and standard model particles that to a large degree uh, make it difficult to, to construct uh, successful WIMP models in this mass range. Um, and because of that, um, there has been a lot of interest in, in looking more closely at these various different bounds here and understand in, in which ways um, they can be evaded in order to have dark matter particles at, at smaller masses. Because at smaller masses, you can see that all of these constraints here are, are very quickly losing sensitivity. So we have basically uh, too small dark matter mass, too small kinetic energy to leave an observable uh, signal in, in our experiments. So this is basically uh, the, the starting point for this talk, to understand the kinds of dark matter models that live outside of this traditional uh, WIMP window. And more specifically, as stated in the title, I, I will focus on dark matter particles that are basically just below what we would conventionally call, call WIMPs. Uh, and for, for kind of lack of creativity, these models are often just called sub gb dark matter. So their defining feature being that they have masses just below the, the GED scale. So this brings me already to my attempt to kind of provide a, a definition of sub-GV dark matter. For the purpose of this talk, this means particles with a mass below the GEV scale that undergo the, the standard freeze-out mechanism, meaning that they start in thermal equilibrium with other particles and then somehow decouple and, and obtain a... Uh, a relic abundance. Uh, just to remind you um, uh, what, what that means in practice, what this means in practice is that the dark matter particles start by following this equilibrium curve shown here, where the y-axis has the dimensionless number density and the x-axis has a dimensionless inverse temperature. So time goes to the right, the number density of dark matter particles becomes exponentially suppressed as the particles become non-relativistic, and then at some point they depart from equilibrium uh, and, and freeze out. Uh, and essentially the abundance that we're left with is set by the freeze out temperature, which in turn is set by the annihilation cross-section. Uh, and the annihilation cross-section is a function of the dark matter mass, and this is exactly what then leads to this Lee-Weinberg bound that I mentioned which in a nutshell just says if we want to make use of the weak interactions of the standard model, so the weak interactions with capital W, uh, W and Z boson exchange, then basically uh, the relic abundance scales uh, as one over the dark matter mass squared. And for this to be consistent with observations, so smaller than the observed value, the dark matter mass has to be greater than approximately 5 G. This is just the statement that if we rely exclusively on the known interactions of the standard model, dark matter particles that go through this free self mechanism cannot be arbitrarily light. And you can immediately turn this argument around. If you want to think about sub-GV dark matter, then the implication is clearly that we have to invoke a new type of interaction. So we cannot rely exclusively on the, the known uh, four forces of nature but we have to introduce some new type of exchange model. And maybe the, the conceptually simplest possibility is that we take the simplest interaction uh, that we know, which is electromagnetism, and we create a copy of it. So we consider a new U1 prime gauge symmetry uh, under which uh, the, the dark matter particles are charged. Uh, now, of course, this U1 prime gauge symmetry uh, can't be uh, can't be unbroken, that would give rise to long-range forces. So we need some spontaneous symmetry breaking or a Stuckelberg mechanism to give the, the gauge boson a mass. So we end up with a, a massive gauge boson, which we call the dark photon. And for this massive gauge boson, there's actually a very simple way how it can couple to standard model particles, namely through kinetic mixing. So this is just uh, exploiting the fact that uh, the field strength tensor of electromagnetism and the new U1 prime field strength tensors are gauge invariant, and, and therefore the, the two photons uh, can mix with each other. 
And what we then end up with at the end of the day is couplings that are proportional to Chuck. So the dark photon will couple to all standard model particles with a strings, strength proportional to their charge and a suppression proportional to a parameter that, that we call epsilon or kappa, which parameterizes this mixing between the two gauge bosons. And what's conceptually very nice about the setup is that we actually have a pretty good understanding of how these dark photons would behave because they behave exactly like off-shell photons. And we can study off-shell photons in the laboratory, for example, by colliding electrons and positrons and measuring the spectrum of, of hadrons that we produce. So we can obtain plots like this one here, which give us branching ratios of how the dark photon would decay into leptons and, and hadrons as a function the dark photon mass. Uh, what do you mean offshore photons? Do you mean that it is massive? It has uh, longitudinal polarization? Do you mean that? So, just, just this or something else? So what I mean is that uh, when you have an, a process, for example, E plus, E minus goes to pi plus, pi minus through a, a photon exchange, the cross-section for that is related to this branching ratio here of the dark photon. This is not the longitudinal mode because the longitudinal mode doesn't couple. Uh, in, in this case, we have purely vector couplings um, for, for this gauge symmetry. So the longitudinal mode doesn't, doesn't contribute. It's really the two transverse modes that, that dominate these interactions. Uh, and, and those we can, we can really get from, from these hadronic cross-section uh, ratios and so on. Does that answer your question? I'm still confused. Uh, What's the difference uh, between onshore and offshore process? Why do why so I'm, I'm just missed the point. Why is this dark photon should be offshore? Should ah, sorry, no. Offshore? So but, do you no, you you're comparing an, an on-shell dark photon to an off-shell standard model photon. So the standard model photon, of course, has to be off-shell to produce a pair of pions or something. So if I have a pair of pions of some invariant mass, then I can relate that to the decay mode of a dark photon with rest mass equal to the invariant mass of the pion. Yeah. That, that's, that's the idea. So, yeah. OK, so, so this, this means that, that this part is, is kind of theoretically under control, and that makes these, these dark photon models uh, are quite, quite appealing to, to work with. Um, but this is uh, not the only uh, thing that, that we need. Of course, we need to make sure if we introduce a new type of interaction that we're actually consistent with all the different uh, constraints that, that we have. And the first set of constraints come, come from cosmology. And in particular, if we introduce a new particle that, that decays dominantly into leptons, we can potentially mess up a lot of cosmological observables. In particular, if these particles have masses in, in the MeV range, where we, we start to actually have cosmological data. So we basically have a, a pretty good understanding of the evolution of the universe uh, below temperatures of something like 5 MeV, which is when, when neutrinos uh, decouple uh, from the, the thermal bath. And if you have dark photons that decay, for example, into E plus E minus after the neutrinos have decoupled, then you can change a lot of things. You would heat the electron photon plasma uh, which then changes the temperature of the photons relative to the neutrino temperature. So effectively, you change the number of relativistic degrees of freedom. You could even, if you, if you produce hard enough electrons or photons, destroy some of the elements that have already been formed uh, during Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Uh, and in combination, these different considerations translate into a bound on dark photon masses, or what's shown here equivalently is, is the dark matter rephrase this in terms of dark matter annihilation through dark photon exchange, you basically get very robust bounds at the level of something like 10 MeV. So there's a small dependence on kind of the, the spin, the number of degrees of freedom of, uh, of the dark matter particles. But roughly speaking, you can't have particles lighter than something like 10 MeV. And this was the, the second uh, constraint that I had in my, my mass plot in the beginning, uh, which is the, the BBN constraint roughly at, at a few MeV. It's essentially impossible, or you have to work very, very hard with, with very detailed cancellations 
to have thermal particles with masses below a few MeV. So if we're interested in, in particles that come from thermal equilibrium, then this is almost a, a model independent part lower bound on, on their masses. So we can translate that into a second implication on our models, which is that we're interested actually in a quite narrow range between the GeV scale and above something like 10 MeV. So the models that I'm going to look at live in essentially those two orders of magnitude between 10 MeV and, and the GeV. But even in that window, there are additional very strong constraints that, that we have to think about uh, and that guide our, our model building. Uh, and one of the most important ones is the fact that dark matter annihilations, even if they are very rare, if they are much too rare to, to affect Big Bang nucleosynthesis, they can still leave an imprint on the cosmic microwave background. Uh, and the reason is that the residual dark matter annihilations that happen after recombination basically can reionize some of the neutral hydrogen um, that is formed. So they, they change, in a sense, the, the optical depth of the universe uh, and thereby change uh, the, the CMB anisotropies uh, away from observations. Um, and in fact, the dark matter annihilations may even still be, be, be observable in the present universe. Uh, they, they can produce gamma rays to which we aren't really sensitive because we don't have good instruments in the kind of tens to hundreds MeV range. But they also produce X-rays through various processes that, that cascade the energies down from MeVs to below MeV. And then you get constraints, uh, for example, uh, the one shown here from XMM Newton. So this was a very nice paper from last year where they pointed out uh, that you get actually these quite strong constraints across the entire range from MeV to GeV from these X-ray observations. Uh, and below 100 MeV, what's shown here at the bottom, these are the CMB constraints for S-wave annihilation that are even stronger here. And the bounds should be compared to the black line up here, which indicates the typical cross-section that we need for thermal freeze out. And you see immediately that the bounds are stronger by two to three orders of magnitude, which basically tells you immediately that these models cannot work with simple velocity independent, what we call S-wave annihilation. So if we had, uh, sorry, just a second, if, if we had uh, annihilations independent of the dark matter velocity so that they happen basically in all cosmological uh, eras, uh, we would be very strongly excluded um, by these constraints. What's that? What's the line which is called Leo T gas heating? What does that mean? Um, ah, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know. So, so this is, in, in this paper here, they consider different types of observations. I think all of the lines, no, actually, I'm not sure if that paper comes from this paper or from yeah. another one. I, I don't know. It's a good question. I don't know what Leo T is, but gas heating, I mean, is, is basically yes, it's energy some, injected some into energy some energy system. Yeah, some yeah, galaxy, yeah. Galaxy cluster. Yes. Mm -hmm. We would need the astral galaxy. Sorry, that's a dwarf galaxy. Dwarf galaxy, yeah. So it's the gas temperature of this Leo T dwarf, which is quite far away from the Milky Way. It's sensitive to any uh, like uh, in energy injection, basically. Okay, nice. Thank you very much. So it's essentially a similar argument as for the CMB annihilations, but with a different observable. Okay, thanks. Nice. Okay, so, so that brings us to the, the third kind of key implication, key ingredient uh, that, that will guide us, which is that we have to find a way to suppress the, the late time annihilations of dark matter to, to satisfy all of these constraints. And the simplest way how you can achieve that is by making the um, dark matter annihilations velocity dependent. Uh, and in fact, you, you could just uh, consider a case where you have to have angular momentum in the annihilation process. So you have something like P wave annihilation such that sigma times velocity is proportional to, to velocity squared. And there are dark matter velocities that, that uh, there, there are dark matter models that achieve that basically out of the box, for example, scalar dark matter. 
Uh, so this is a, a possibility, and I will come back to that later. Um, but I want to point out that also for fermionic dark matter, where at, at face value at first sight you have S-wave annihilation, it is actually possible to have such a velocity dependence if the dark matter uh, mass sits sufficiently close to a resonance. And the resonance is, is of course, given by the, the dark photon mass. So if I define this parameter here, which is the basically the dark photon mass minus two times the dark matter mass in, in some dimensionless form, then this parameterizes how close uh, the, uh, the invariant mass of a dark matter pair at rest is to the dark photon mass. And this quantifies how much resonant enhancement non-relativistic dark matter particles can receive. So if this parameter epsilon r is much smaller than one, then what that means is that at some point during freeze out, uh, we hit a resonance condition where the kinetic energy is exactly what is needed to bring the dark matter particles onto resonance, onto the dark photon resonance, and thereby enhance the annihilation cross-section. And in the plot on the right here, you see exactly how, how this plays out in, in practice. So there's this resonance parameter on the x-axis, and on the y-axis, there's the kinetic mixing parameter kappa that we need to satisfy the observed dark matter relic abundance. So the black line here is what gives us the, the observed dark matter relic abundance with some theoretical uncertainty. This is not so important right now. Um, but the key point is that the X-ray bound that we saw on the previous slide is just a straight line. This scales trivially. Uh, with this resonance parameter, because the dark matter particles are basically at zero velocity. Whereas for the freeze out, which happens at finite temperatures, at finite velocities, this curve has a non trivial shape. And that means that there's a range roughly between epsilon 10 to the minus 2 and 10 to the minus 1, where we get around the X ray constraint. And only if we go very far away from the resonance or we go basically below the resonance. Uh, we are actually excluded by these X-ray constraints. So this is a different way, even if uh, the resonance itself is S-wave, to achieve a velocity dependence. And this is the, the resonant uh, dark matter that I mentioned in the title. The second possibility is, is in a sense, even more radical, which is that we try to suppress late-time uh, annihilations altogether by assuming that dark matter particles basically run out of antiparticles to annihilate with. And this is, of course, exactly what happens for, for baryons, for visible matter, that there wouldn't be any baryons left in the, in the present universe if we didn't have an asymmetry between particles and antiparticles. And in analogy, we can consider dark matter asymmetry, so a difference between particles and antiparticles. And this asymmetry, of course, is constrained by the actual dark matter abundance. We can't have a larger asymmetry than, than 100%. And this 100% just translates into, into this number here, 4 times 10 to the minus 10 GeV divided by the dark matter mass. So this is just the, the, the maximal amount of, of dark matter particles of a given mass that we can have. And if this eta actually gets close to this upper bound, then what that tells you is that the dark matter in the present universe is basically all particles and no antiparticles. So we simply cannot have annihilation signals because there are no antiparticles to annihilate with. Uh, and this is shown in the plot here. This is basically the same plot that we saw a couple of slides ago, dark matter mass on the x-axis and annihilation cross-section on the y-axis, except that now it's a rescaled annihilation cross-section multiplied with uh, the probability of finding a pair of particles that can annihilate with each other. And up here we have again, this, this was the black line before, a few times 10 to the minus 26 centimeter cubed per second. And as you increase eta dark matter, this line moves down and down and down. And somewhere here, starting from an eta dark matter, which is 0.9999 times the saturated value, you get around the indirect detection constraint. So do you know what the CM, so the CMB bound, I guess, is coming from what spectral energy injection, like spectral distortion or something? Uh, and not, not spectral distortion, just energy injection. So, just, so re ionization. But so I would have, I mean, why is there a key? I mean, I would have just expected a line essentially. Uh, 
Okay, good. Yes. So to, to first approximation, this is really a, a diagonal line, which yeah. is scales as one over the dark matter mass. Okay, this is just the, the number density. And everything else that you see here has to do basically with the efficiency of the, the annihilation products to deposit energy in the plasma. So for okay. example, the most prominent feature that you see here, this, this kind of peak, this is just from an enhancement in the hadronic branching ratio. Oh, so I in see. that particular okay. mass, okay. you don't go into electrons and muons, which are very efficient in depositing nice. energy, but you go into pions. And that means it's kind of the process is a bit slower, you lose some energy into other channels, and therefore the constraint gets a bit weaker. A bit weaker. So this is actually, this is actually uh, in, in that sense, this plot is a bit different from what I showed before in the, in the plot that I had before. This was just for one channel. I think this assumes yeah. just a constant uh, injection efficiency. And here in this plot, we actually calculate uh, the uh, injection efficiency for this particular model. Yeah, thanks for asking. That's, a, that's an important point. Uh, same for the x-rays, right? Also, there the branching ratios matter, and that's why the shape is, is more non-trivial. Okay, so uh, this basically brings me to the, the model setup that, that I wanted to, to motivate. Uh, so so the, the model that, that I will talk about uh, over the next 20 minutes or so has essentially four parameters. So there's the dark matter mass, uh, which is uh, somewhere in the MeV to GeV range, although we've already seen that it's more like 10 MeV to a GeV. There's the dark photon mass, which uh, in, in the following I will always replace by this resonance parameter. So just keeping in mind that small epsilon r basically means that the dark photon mass is twice the dark matter mass. There's the gauge coupling corresponding to the U1 prime gauge group, uh, which essentially is, is uh, first principles only constrained by a perturbativity bound to be smaller than something like square root four pi. And there's the kinetic mixing parameter that, that connects the, the two U1s. Uh, which has a pretty robust upper bound from electroweak precision data of something like 10 to the minus 2. So those are the, the parameters and, and parameter ranges that we will be interested in. And then finally, I, I will also uh, come back to this asymmetry parameter, which can either be zero, then there's no particle-antiparticle asymmetry, or it can be as large as, as the upper bound. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Point, uh, again, why do you need a dark photon in this setup? Can you just work with single dark matter particle, like scalar, the range from one MeV to one GeV? Yeah, so, so the reason why I need the dark photon is basically the Lee Weinberg bound. I just had the dark matter particle mm -hmm. and I were to give a couplings to the Z boson, for example, then the interaction would be too weak. I would end up with too much dark matter. So I need an interaction. Mm -hmm. It's essentially stronger than the weak interaction at these low masses. So I need yeah. to have a gauge boson with a mass that's smaller than the same boson mass, basically. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so let me quickly talk about some of the constraints that we have to uh, actually evaluate for this model to find viable parameter space. And one constraint that's, that's very uh, robust and, and fairly model independent uh, comes from uh, dark matter self-interactions. Uh, so we have this famous observation of the bullet cluster, which shows that dark matter and, and baryons behave very differently. And in particular, this picture shows us that there are two galaxy, two dark matter halos that remain intact after the, the collision of these two galaxy clusters. And this implies a bound on the dark matter self-interaction cross-section. Uh, this is a bound that varies a bit from, from paper to paper. Uh, we actually reanalyzed some, some of the data and found this bound 1.4 centimeters squared per gram, um, which actually requires, this is just a side remark um, for, for those who have thought about this, there is a relatively strong implicit assumption here, which is that the mass to light ratios of both of these galaxy clusters are initially correlated. If you relax this assumption, you actually get a much weaker bound of something like five centimeters squared per gram. But this assumption of correlated mass to light ratios is, is what is commonly done, and, and we use the same thing to get this bound, which is basically what you also find in the literature. 
Then, of course, we can directly search for, for dark photons. Uh, and the simplest way that we can do this is by looking at this kind of diagram here. So we start with an electron beam and we consider the possibility of Bremsstrahlung production of dark photons. And then these dark photons would decay, for example, into a pair of dark matter particles. So leave the, the detector as, as invisible energy. And this is something that we can search for, for example, in, in BABA, so e plus e minus collisions or NA64 with electron beam dumps. Or we can go even one step further and try to detect the dark matter particles produced in the dark photon decay through some uh, scattering in downstream detectors. This is basically right now done by repurposing neutrino experiments like LSD and, and Minigoon. And, and these different approaches give uh, uh, various kinds of bounds. The Baba one extends to the largest masses, of course, because Baba has comparably high center of mass energy. But then the, these beam dump experiments have the advantage that the small dark photon or here dark metamasses, they actually get very strong. So we can probe kappas down to 10 to the minus five uh, potentially. So this plot has two types of lines, uh, just as a side remark. The dashed lines are the bounds that you find in the literature. The solid lines are our implementation. So what we actually did for this project was to rerun the kinds of Monte Carlo simulations that you need to produce, the, to generate the dark photon production and, and decay and, and scattering and so on. And the reason for that is that we want to have full likelihood functions. We, won't just, we don't just want to have a, a bound that gives us allowed or excluded, but we want to translate each of these bounds into a likelihood uh, that, that scales in a continuous way as a function of the different model parameters. We do the same thing for dark matter direct detection. Uh, there are two types of experiments here that are interesting, dark matter electron scattering. This is a big industry now with, with many different experiments that place relevant constraints in the sub-GV mass range, and dark matter nuclear scattering. So dark matter nuclear scattering, as I said in the beginning, is mostly insensitive uh, to sub-GV dark matter, with the, the most notable exception being the CREST-3 experiment, which has the, the lowest threshold that, that has been achieved so far by, by any such experiment. So it actually goes down to a, a few hundred MeV. And then there's something else which is interesting, which is the, the so-called Migdal effect. So this is basically an inelastic process in which uh, nuclear recoil leads to an ionization, so an, uh, the, the emission of, of an electron from an atom. And this, again, lowers the effective threshold. So we can actually go down, potentially, all the way to, to the 10 MeV or so uh, that, that we have as, as lower bound on the dark matter mass. Uh, the bound that, that we've implemented is, is Panda X, which is actually not the strongest bound. The, the strongest bound comes from the strongest published bound comes from LZ, but their analysis is so complicated that we weren't able to, to cast that into a likelihood function, whereas for Panda X, this, this works reasonably well. Uh, so, so this is basically the, the summary of constraints uh, that we have implemented for direct detection. And now once we have all of these different things, so the indirect detection constraints that I mentioned in the beginning, the CMB constraints, BBN constraints, uh, self-interactions, direct detection, accelerators, we want to throw all of this together. So effectively, what, what we want to do is, is to perform a global fit. Uh, and this is something that, that requires dedicated tools and, and, and quite big efforts. So it's fortunate for us that this effort has been carried out over the past decade or so and, and published as, as the Gambit framework, a global and modular BSM inference tool. So the idea here is to have a framework where you essentially, once you have coded up the individual likelihoods uh, for a model, uh, you have very efficient ways of scanning the, the parameter space, uh, introduce nuisance parameters, and also change the, the models, change the data sets, and, and run all of this on, uh, on big supercomputers. And what Gambit does internally is to produce what we call a dependency tree. So it generates these graphs where each of the boxes basically corresponds to one calculation that needs to be performed uh, for uh, the final likelihood uh, to be calculated. So here's an example of what we need 
in order to get the, the, the CMB bound, the Planck bound on, on energy injection. So to calculate this bound, we first of all need to know how much dark matter we have. So we need to perform a relic density calculation. This requires cross sections, and then we use dark SUSY as Boltzmann solver. This gives us uh, things like the, uh, the residual asymmetry. And then what we discussed a moment ago, we need these injection spectra. We need branching ratios. We need to understand how efficient the energy is deposited for, for different types of channels. And then all of this needs to be put together and, and phrased into some form of, of likelihood uh, that comes directly from the CMB data and then gives us constraints on our, on our models. Uh, and this is one of the, the many different likelihood calculations that we have to perform for each parameter point uh, in our scans. And once you've done that, you end up with plots like these ones here. So, so just to remind you, we have a four-dimensional parameter space. Uh, so in each of these panels, uh, this is projected down into a two-dimensional space where the other two parameters are adjusted in such a way that the likelihood is, is maximized. So what you see here, for example, is the dark matter mass versus the, this resonance parameter. And anything that's wide is excluded. So there's no combination of parameters in the other two dimensions that would lead to viable points, whereas these blue regions are actually allowed. And you see essentially exactly what I told you before, that we would like to have this resonance parameter to be around 10 to the minus 1 or so, larger than 10 to the minus 2 and smaller than 1, to have available parameters. The dark matter mass needs to be larger than something like 10 MeV. And then there are other constraints here, bullet cluster, bar bar, NA64, which actually don't really touch the allowed parameter space. So what that tells you is that for, for this case of fermionic dark matter, really the requirement of, of having the resonance, so the indirect detection constraints, are what determines the allowed parameter space more or less completely. So, so the really difficult constraint is, is the one uh, that comes from the CMB observations. So then, of course, the interesting question is how does this picture change when we allow for the asymmetry? So when we switch on this fifth parameter, that gives us another way to evade the indirect detection constraints. And, and you can see immediately that the allowed parameter regions grow very significantly in, in different directions. We can now have an epsilon, which is actually quite a bit larger than one, so we can be further away from the resonance. We don't necessarily have to this resonant enhancement. We can in particular go to larger gauge couplings, so that means larger dark photon widths, so broader resonances, up to the point where the bullet cluster constraint becomes relevant. So here the parameter space is really bounded by, by this bullet cluster bound. And we can also go to larger kinetic mixing parameters up to the point where we touch the bar bar and NA64 constraints. And here in the final plot, this has now the asymmetry parameter on the y-axis. And what you can see is that we have, we find both solutions with very small asymmetry. So that would be the same solutions that, that we had before in, in, in this scan. But in particular, we find solutions which have an asymmetry that's basically as large as possible. So that saturates the, the, uh, the observed dark matter relic abundance. That's really fully asymmetric. Yes? So my question is really, what is the full likelihood really? I mean, what does it tell you more than, you know, I probably I could have guessed that this was going to happen maybe, or is it not intuitive that this is what, you probably get a best fit point or something like that when you run the full thing and that's complicated. Uh, but is there some non-trivial intuition that I get by running the full likelihood? Okay, very good. So. Um, I think, I think, of course, the the kind of um, ideal scenario is that you have likelihoods that exhibit some kinds of preferences for for certain regions and parameter space, and then then of course it becomes very interesting. Uh, this is not something that that happens here. You see that the allowed parameter regions are are relatively flat, um, with some small exceptions. So, for example, actually, you see the best fit point, this white star, is actually relatively close or is basically on this bullet cluster bound and this has to do with some very mild preference for for 
or non-zero dark matter self interactions in the specific likelihood that we implemented. Uh, so this is an example for something that you could potentially learn. I think the more important point is that it's not actually trivial to find these allowed parameter regions. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in these particular plots, it looks like basically all of the parameter space is allowed, but this is really because we are projecting down. If you think, for example, about the, this epsilon r parameter, uh, then you realize that this actually is a relatively finely tuned region in parameter space, right? This epsilon r being typically smaller than one means that you have to have tuning of, I don't know, one part in five or one part in 10 between the dark matter mass and the dark photon mass. And having the full likelihoods actually guides the, the scanners, right? If you have a likelihood, that means you have a gradient in your likelihood. Yeah. You can, starting from any point, you can figure out kind of in which direction you have to evolve to find the, the preferred regions of parameter space. And can so, you uh, really believe these little, you know, islands and wiggly lines and things like that? Because, you know, if I was staring at that, I'd say, this looks like one convergence. Okay, good. So, so um, uh, we, we, we work very hard to get the convergence as good as possible within what's reasonable. Uh, we don't, at, at some point, we just stop and say there's no point spending another million CPU hours, whatever energy bill that translates into, to get nicer plots. So, so we just stop there. Uh, in principle, things like this here, for example, this will smooth out. This is actually a region that's pretty hard to, to sample because we have quite a few orders of magnitude here in this eta parameter and then a hard cutoff. Um, that's, that's a difficult parameter space to, to sample comprehensively and then kind of combine different scans and, and so on. But we also have features that are actually physical. So for example, here, what you see is again, this hadronic resonance. So the, the sampler actually has the resolution that it, it, it finds these kinds of physical features as well. So. Um, so we, we do put in a lot of effort here, but then at some point we say the plots are good enough qualitatively, the conclusions mm -hmm. will not change at that point, and then we, we don't spend more resources on it. Uh, but that's a fine balance, right? It's also, you can, of course, you could also, you know, massage these plots, make the bins larger, and then everything looks nicer, but I think that's the point. I think, yeah. Yeah, it's it's a question of both resources and time, right? How, yeah, how yeah, yeah. So, what what are the values of this white star point? So you you have white star point based feed point. What are the values for the meta mass? Yeah, good. Right. So, so I, I I don't want to overemphasize the the best fit point here because to first approximation the likelihood is flat, right? So between this point and that point. Uh, the difference in likelihood is is maybe uh, a factor of of three or so. So in in terms of of log likelihood, this is maybe a one sigma one point five sigma reference. Uh, this is not something that that will tell us anything specific about the the nature of dark matter. So I think here really the the message here is in the boundary between blue and white, so between allowed and excluded. Um, and the best fit point just happens to come from, you know, fluctuations in the data. You would, with basically any data set, you would, would expect the best fit point somewhere. One thing that we can do quite easily is also take this parameter space and project it into other directions, for example, into the parameter plane relevant for direct detection. And then you see again that basically all of the constraints that we have implemented are actually relevant. So both the electron scattering and nuclear scattering bounds actually touch the allowed parameter region, meaning that they shape from some direction the, the allowed regions. Okay, so, so along the lines of the, the question that you just asked about kind of the meaning of the best fit point, an interesting question that we can ask is whether there is actually a preference for the asymmetric dark matter model over the symmetric dark matter model. And if you're uh, trying to answer this question in terms of frequentist statistics, then the answer is there is no preference. We have a uh, um, minus two delta log L of, of something like two, so maybe a one sigma preference uh, uh, with the price of one additional parameter. So, so this is not interesting. But what's what's much more interesting to my mind 
is that we are really reducing the tuning in the parameter space. So we are moving from these fairly constrained regions. Epsilon has to be small. G has to be mm -hmm. small. Uh, was there a question? Please. Okay, no, just a glitch. Uh, to, to these much larger allowed parameter regions. Um, and this is potentially interesting if you're worried about fine tuning, if you're worried, for example, about how closely we have to tune the dark matter mass to the resonance condition. And the way that we can think about this question uh, is in terms of Bayesian evidence. So essentially, try and quantify the, the, the size of the allowed parameter region uh, according to a measure which is essentially given by the priors that we assign to, to our various parameters. So we can basically just by flipping a switch, we can redo all of our scans in, in the context of, of Bayesian rather than frequentist statistics. And we get plots that are essentially the same. If you stare at these long enough, then, then you will see that they are consistent with, with what I showed before. Uh, these are the typical triangle plots that, that uh, you, you know if you're a cosmologist uh, with two small exceptions. Uh, the first one is that they are not triangle plots because we actually fill the upper half with, with scatter plots. So rather than having kind of densities of posteriors, which you normally see in the bottom left corner, we also have scatter plots in the, in the top right corner, but it's basically the same information, right? This uh, region here in the bottom left corresponds to this region here in the top right and so on. And the second additional piece of information, which is often not shown, is the comparison of the prior and the posterior. So blue here is always the prior. This is essentially the probability that we assign to the parameter space before we have seen the data. Uh, and, and orange is then what the data tells us about the parameter space. And this is important because this basically visualizes the compression, the amount of fine tuning that, uh, that measurements imply uh, for our model. And you see this maybe most strikingly for this epsilon parameter. So for, the, for, the, for this resonance parameter, we define the prior by saying the dark matter mass and dark photon mass are completely uncorrelated. We draw them from independent distributions. And that means that this epsilon parameter can potentially be as large as 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7, or something like that. But then the likelihood actually tells us that it needs to be smaller than, than 1. So here we have a a very strong difference between the, the prior and the posterior. This is exactly this, this kind of fine tuning that one might be worried about. And it's exactly this, this fine tuning that is now relaxed in the right panel when we also introduce the asymmetry prompt. Uh, you see here, it's not too easy to see, but if you look closely, you see that, that uh, in particular for this epsilon r, the, the posterior widens a bit compared to the previous case. And the same is true for some of the other parameters, in particular, the, the GDM posterior in the top left is much wider than in the case without asymmetry. Of course, we have a new parameter now, the eta dark matter, which also needs to be tuned to some degree. So it's not obvious whether this actually uh, is beneficial or not uh, for the Bayesian evidences. Uh, but we don't have to work this out by, by looking at the plots. We just get the numbers from, from the scans. Uh, so-called base factors, so, so essentially ratios of, of Bayesian evidences. And the conclusion is within the set of assumptions that, that we put in, we actually do see a, a preference of the asymmetric case over the symmetric case. So we have fermionic dark matter as a, a base factor of around 50. So a preference uh, that know, would be quantified as some moderate preference for the presence of an asymmetry. But it's important to, to emphasize that this exists only for the case of fermionic dark matter and not for the case of scalar dark matter. Because as I mentioned a while ago, for scalar dark matter, we actually have uh, P wave annihilation. So we don't have this requirement of uh, tuning to the resonance at all. Um, just as a, as a small side remark uh, for people interested in, in, in these base factors, you can actually uh, split the Bayesian evidence into two contributions. One, which is uh, essentially the, uh, the typical likelihood, 
and one which is really a fine tuning penalty. So this can be written as kobeck leipler divergence between the, the prior and the posterior. Uh, and, and you see that, uh, well, it's not too easy to see from this plot, but basically what you can see is that uh, it's actually the, the, this kobeck leipler divergence, so this orange line here that's longer in this case than in the other cases, which tells you that it's really the fine tuning penalty disfavors uh, the fermionic symmetric model compared to the other ones. Okay, so, so of course we, are, we don't want to stop at kind of uh, just identifying the allowed parameter space. We would like to understand how we can make progress uh, in kind of the next generation of experiments. So, so this is actually quite easy to do. We can take our allowed parameter regions and compare that to various projections for different experiments. L2, so this line here is actually probably uh, going to uh, be published very soon. This analysis is happening right now. LDMX, on the other hand, is not even funded. So this is an experiment that will maybe happen in five to 10 years. Uh, and again, here are different examples for experiments that, that may happen over the next five to 10 years in, in different parameter planes. And you can see how all of them cut into different corners of the allowed parameter space. Um, in particular, LDMX here is very promising. If you translate basically the volume of the parameter space above the line into, into a percentage, you find that something like two thirds of the allowed parameter space will be prompted with, with LDMX. Uh, so this is uh, basically telling us that we have real prospects of, of seeing these kinds of models in the near future. Uh, moving towards that, uh, this is uh, kind of a um, suggestion that, that we've made for the, for the community to understand uh, these models with asymmetry. It's, it's nice to identify a specific benchmark scenario where we can actually collapse the high dimensional parameter space to, to smaller dimensions. And this is something that's actually quite common in the community. For example, setting the dark photon mass to three times the dark matter mass and the, the gauge coupling to some specific value. But the values that are most commonly used are actually to some degree already ten, in tension with data. In particular, this uh, ratio of three for the masses and the gauge coupling of 1.1. This is a dark fine structure constant of 0.1. This is basically already excluded with the data that we have now. So there's a new benchmark point that, that we are proposing. And if you adopt this benchmark point, the nice thing is that you can make a plot like this one here, which combines all the different projections from all the different experiments. And you can see that the combination of them then actually covers this, this benchmark point entirely uh, with time scales of, again, five to 10 years. So um, I think I'm running out of time. Uh, I should stop at five. Yeah, I can. Yeah, no, no, that's, that's, that's fine. Let me just, I will not go into, into any details. I just want to, to mention a, a third possibility that, that I alluded to in, in the title uh, to get around the indirect detection constraints. Uh, and this is the idea of inelastic dark matter, which is that um, the, the dark matter particle is in fact not just one state, but a combination of two states, which are called chi and chi star, or sometimes chi one and chi two, which have a small mass splitting between them. So this is essentially starting from the same model as before, we, we, where we had a four component Dirac fermion. But now you split uh, this four component Dirac fermion into two, two component Majorana fermions. And you do this in, in such a way that um, the interactions that you have must always involve both states. So that means you have to have a transition from the lighter state to the heavier state or from the heavier state to the lighter state. And in the early universe, this is basically not a problem because both of these states are abundant. So your freeze out will just basically go through co-annihilations of one ground state and one excited state. But in the present universe, the excited states are Boltzmann suppressed. They basically decay away. And again, just like in the case of asymmetric dark matter, there is no annihilation partners. Uh, that these particles can, can annihilate. So once again, you remove the, the indirect detection signals. So uh, let me uh, 
be extremely quick. There's new phenomenology related to this to do with the fact that the excited states can decay. So you can have long-lived particles, displaced vertices in your detectors. The model building details are, are not too important. Um, but the point is that at the end of the day, let me maybe just show uh, the, the final slides from, from our paper. Uh, you can implement these, these inelastic splittings in, in such a way that once again, you evade experimental constraints. So the black line here is what would give us the, the correct relic density compared to the shaded regions, which are our current constraints. And again, here we find viable parameter space uh, that's out of the reach of current experiments, but within the, the reach of the next generation of experiments, in particular here at Bell 2. So to finish up, just uh, one word on, on Outlook. And, and this comes back to something that I said very briefly uh, in the beginning, which is that the relic density calculation is actually quite hard. There is a pretty significant theoretical uncertainty uh, to do with this resonant enhancement. Uh, and this is related to the fact that we cannot simply assume kinetic equilibrium when we solve our Boltzmann equations. Um, because as soon as you have these resonant enhancements, uh, you will have uh, somehow only a small fraction of your dark matter particles can actually annihilate. Uh, and you may have to solve the Boltzmann equation at the full phase space level. Um, these, these strong resonant enhancement cases are also interesting from the point of view of additional constraints. You could, for example, imagine that you can see them in, in CMP spectral distortions and that they can leave an imprint in. EPN. Uh, there was actually a paper on exactly this just a week or two weeks ago. I haven't read it yet, but it looks very interesting. Um, and then, of course, uh, we may also need to think about visible dark photon decays. Uh, so this is basically upcoming work where we want to see how far we can push this resonance um, and, and implement all of these additional constraints and calculations. So with that, let me, let me finish. Um, so what I've focused on in this talk is dark matter particles in the range, uh, naively, first of all, from, from 10 MeV to 100 TeV. This is kind of the thermal dark matter mass range. But then focusing specifically at the sub-GV range where we evade the Lee-Weinberg bound by introducing a dark photon. And then the key message is that we need to get around uh, the indirect detection constraints that we have for velocity-independent annihilations which leads us, for example, to velocity-dependent annihilations, like resonant annihilations, to particle-antiparticle asymmetry, or to inelastic dark matter. Uh, for, the, for the first two cases, I've shown you that there is a preference, actually, for the second solution, so for the particle-antiparticle asymmetry over the, the, the tuned resonance. And in the second case, again, we can evade constraints uh, and, and find viable regions of parameter space all of which are within the reach of the next generation of experiments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have time for questions. Yeah. Well, Bayesian evidences are strongly prior dependent. If you ask three theorists for their favorite um, parameter ranges, you will get 10 different answers. Um, how confident are you in the stability of your um, base factors under variations. Yes, so in, in a sense, uh, I mean, someone had to ask this question, thank you. It's, <laughs> it's important and I, I didn't spend enough time on it. Uh, I think in this case, it's, it's in a sense even worse because our base factors are really dominated by, by this fine tuning term. So these are really basically volume factors and it's not it's not that we have sufficiently strong likelihoods that we have very strongly constrained posteriors. Uh, so this is definitely something to worry about. And in fact, uh, the plot that I've shown here is, is a smaller version of, of a larger plot that we have where we choose different priors to actually show the impact that, that this has on, uh, on the evidences that we get out. And, and one, for example, that is, is quite critical is, is actually the the prior that you choose for this asymmetry parameter. So here, as this plot suggests, we actually choose a, a linear prior for, for eta dark matter, 
which has the, the reason that we want to be able to go down to exactly zero. So we want the symmetric case to be contained within our prior, and then the linear prior is the, the easiest way to achieve that. But you could also say that whether it's 10 to the minus 12 or 10 to the minus 13 is irrelevant, so we just use a log prior. And at that point, of course, your range has a huge impact on your evidence. Whether you go to 10 to the minus 12 or 10 to the minus 13 or 14 will give you very different answers for and I think this is something that we have to live with, right? If we're interested in this question, then the best that we can do, the best that I know of that we can do is to, to make explicit exactly this prior dependence. But I'm not aware of, of a way to remove it. Well, you can't, it's a feature. Yeah, no, exactly. And, but, but there is no, I think there is no unique choice there. And I think really the answer is that there's benefit in doing both, the, the frequentist and the Bayesian analysis, because they will reveal different features, right? They will basically tell you different things about your models and your parameter spaces. And just like the particle physicists are now somehow coming around to thinking about uh, models in, in terms of, of Bayesian statistics, some cosmologists are now going the other way and, and arguing in favor of doing frequentist analysis once in a while, because you get, in particular, when you think about kind of extensions like, like new parameters on top of lambda CDM and so on. It's, it's okay, I'm getting sidetracked, but it's an interesting discussion. Thanks. Okay. Other questions? Also, if you're online, just speak up because I don't see it. Uh, maybe I can ask you one. So, so for, the, for that asymmetric dark matter case, is that all implemented, so the, also the generation of the asymmetry in that simple model, or do you need something beyond? So you have the CP violation, which is needed. Okay, good. So we, we never say anything about what actually generates the asymmetry in the first yeah. place. So, so this asymmetry parameter is really, for us, a fundamental parameter. Mm -hmm. But of so course, basically, in, phenomenologically, in, in there has to be some UV completion. Exactly. In, in practice, it, it wouldn't be a fundamental parameter. It would yeah. come from from something else. Um, and this is, this is potentially not, not trivial because we are breaking the, the U1 prime at relatively low temperatures, mm -hmm. right? So we have dark photon masses of hundreds of MeV. The VEF is, is maybe at, at a GeV or so. So, so this is, and, and up to that point, you, you would expect charge conservation to hold. Yes. So, so this is not trivial to do. Um, there are, of course, ways that this can be done and has been done. The uh, question then is also, do you want to relate it to the baryon asymmetry? Do you want to somehow solve both of them with one mechanism, or do you treat them as completely separate? This is something that, that we haven't entered. Yeah. I guess it's getting more model dependent, than, or very model dependent. Exactly, yeah. I mean, it, it can be done, and there are papers that, that do it, and... Um, I don't think it creates additional constraints. I don't think the, the phenomenology impacts what, what we have looked at. Um, so in that sense, it, it factorizes. Okay, good. Yeah, thanks. Hey, I wanted to ask a couple of questions also. Yes, yes please. please. Ah, yeah. Uh, like, it's a bit related to this, like, uh, regarding, like, the mass of the dark photons, like, how do you generate it? Because I guess, like, mass terms are forbidden uh, from like from gauge symmetry so i guess you use some like uh, hidden hick sector or something okay good yeah i was i was very brief on that so so actually um if you have an abelian symmetry so if we just have a, a u1 symmetry then actually there is a way to introduce a, a mass term without actually breaking the u1 symmetry which is the stuckelberg mechanism so this is basically introducing one additional field, one additional degree of freedom, which couples in exactly such a way uh, as, a, as a longitudinal mode. Um, so so this, this can be done, but it's, it's maybe a, a, bit, uh, a bit more arcane. So the, the more intuitive is, as you say, to have a kind of extra dark Higgs mechanism. So to have actually another particle, a, a dark Higgs boson, which obtains a vacuum expectation value, and then generates the, the dark H boson mass. Um, this is actually now something that we're looking at in a follow-up model, because this is potentially something that's interesting in itself. 
if you have a spontaneously a spontaneous symmetry breaking below the GV scale, then that can potentially be connected to a phase transition. It can potentially be even a strong first order phase transition. And, and this may be interesting in the context of gravitational wave signals. So in a sense, you can think of this as an additional feature of the model rather than, than a constraint. But of course, then you have to make sure that the dark Higgs boson is actually also consistent with all data that we have. So it requires a bit of extra work. Yeah, I see. Uh, thank you. And like the other question I had is like, how different like are the interactions you are considering like in the like in the scalar model compared to the fermion? Because like I guess you cannot have uh, like the same interactions, right? Like at least in the Lagrangian, I mean. So it's it, it is actually quite similar, and and in the paper I, I didn't show it here, but in the paper we we have all of the analysis also for this case the case of scalar dark matter. So the coupling of 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 scalar dark matter to to the dark photon is is basically just what you would expect from a charge complex scalar. So it goes with with the derivative coupled to the it's basically a covariant derivative. Um, so d mu phi d mu phi. Um, and, and that gives you, uh, to, to large degrees, the same phenomenology. So, for example, direct detection is basically exactly the same for scalar dark matter and fermionic dark matter. But the one crucial difference is this angular momentum factor in the annihilation cross-section, so the P-wave versus S-wave. But a lot of the other things, also the, the accelerator constraints, self-interaction constraints, they are basically the same for, for fermionic and scalar dark matter. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Um, okay, I, I have one more question, but I see <laughs> that your people also have to leave. <laughs> That's the thing. Yes, yeah, yeah, everyone should should leave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so let, let me ask you about, what, what, one more question. So, so for, for the dark matter annihilation, you basically always go by the dark photon into standard model particles. Um, in principle, there could also be the case that you have, let's say, for fermionic dark matter, you annihilate into the dark Higgs. Um, does yeah. that play any role or in, in any region of parameter space? Yes, very, very good. So, I mean, the first thing that you could try is to annihilate into the dark photons, mm -hmm. but then the dark photons actually have to be the lightest states, yes. right? So they can no longer decay invisibly. They would decay back into standard model particles, and that creates all kinds of problems. Like they would mm -hmm. be... Uh, they, they would show up in all kinds of other, like, beam dump experiments and so on. So... We always want the dark photon to be sufficiently heavy that it decays invisibly. But then when you have the dark Higgs boson, then indeed you have basically both possibilities. The dark Higgs boson can be heavier or lighter. And it's actually quite an interesting possibility that the dark Higgs boson is the lighter state, and then dark matter would perinihilate into the dark Higgs bosons, and then they would decay visibly. And then basically the, the main remaining question is whether they can decay fast enough to recover a standard cosmology before BBM. Mm -hmm. So you have to go through some Higgs mixing or something to make sure that they decay away before you then have uh, cosmological data. But this can be done. This, okay, this, has, yeah. Been, yeah. this has been shown. Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK, good. Yeah, thanks. Um, any last question or online? Well, if not, then let's thank Felix again for a very nice talk.